In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gospel picked up today where it left off last week. So, and I know you were all here and heard it, but I'll just um, refresh your memories. Yesterday, last week's gospel was the story of the feeding of the 5,000. How Jesus had compassion on this crowd that had followed him into the desert, and he fed 5,000 men, not counting women and children, probably even more, with five barley loaves of bread and two fish. And then when that had been done, Jesus had gone away to pray. In the night, his disciples had taken their their boats and started to cross the Sea of Galilee back to Capernaum, and Jesus had come to them walking on the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a storm. And that was where the gospel ended as they arrived at shore and Jesus arrived with them. So as we pick up today, it says, well, the, so all these five people, 5,000 people or so who were on the other side, the next morning went looking for Jesus. Why were they looking for Jesus? Well, apparently they thought they could get another free meal. Um, so they got in their boats and they went and said, well, he's not here. Let's go back to Capernaum. They went over and they looked for him. And they went to look for Jesus, and, they're, and he was like, Rabbi, when did you get here? And like, you gave us the slip. And Jesus saw right through it. Very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. In other words, you just thought you'd get another free meal. And then he goes on to say, do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Now I'd like to pause for a second and talk about the Gospel of John, which was, comes from in general, because it's different from the other three Gospels that we read. In the other three Gospels, Jesus has a saying, does a healing, does something, goes on to the next place, says something else, does something else. And he's just, he's moving around with, and it's telling the story of this is what Jesus did and this is what Jesus said. John, on the other hand, tells a story of something significant that Jesus said or did and then follows it with a long discourse on the meaning of it. John always refers to those somethings that Jesus said or did as a sign. Now a sign, we're familiar if you go out right out here on the highway, we have signs. What do they do? They point us to things. They tell us important things. So for example, the first sign in John's gospel was the changing of water into wine. And then it's followed by more signs. And we get into chapter 3, you have Nicodemus coming to Jesus and Jesus telling him, you need to be born again from above and be born of water and the Spirit. And he's getting into talking about something, what the meaning of all this is. And then in the next chapter, you have the woman at the well where Jesus said, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask him for water. He would give you the water that bubbles up to eternal life. And so all of this meaning is coming out in here. And it has to do with the real basic content of what it means to be a believer, a follower, someone who trusts their life to Jesus Christ. And it also has a lot to do with how we live that out in the context of our Christian community, i.e. through our sacramental life. Anytime John talks about water, he's talking about baptism. And anytime he talks about bread or wine, he's talking about the Holy Eucharist, our two main sacraments. But it's not just that we have them, it's what they mean. That's what we're getting at here. So, the sign, feeding of 5,000 people in the middle of the desert where there's nothing else, walking on the water. There's more than one thing that those signs point to. But one of them, and in almost every case in John, one of the questions that the sign is pointing to is, who is this Jesus guy anyway? Why would it make a difference? 
And John starts out his gospel telling us that Jesus is not like everybody else who there ever was, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. All things were made through him. And the Word that, that gives life was coming into the world, etc. We're told right from the beginning that Jesus is not like any other prophet, not like any other person, and that he's the key figure of history. But then we're continually comparing him to these other figures in Israel's past to reinforce this message. So, for example, the woman at the well, when Jesus says to her, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me, I'd give you this water that leads to eternal life, and then you'd never be thirsty again. And she says, so are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? Well, the obvious answer is yes. But they wouldn't have thought that. Now here in today's gospel, feeding 5,000 in the middle of the desert, walking on water. Well, Moses led the people through the desert where they were, where, quote, Moses fed them manna from heaven. Moses also parted the Red Sea so that they could walk through on land. So Jesus is being compared to Moses, and he's well aware of that. You know, what sign, of, when he says, this is the work you must do that you must believe, that is, trust your life to, the, to the, him who God sent, me. Ah, me as in Jesus. And they're going, well, what sign are you going to give? And I'm, I'm thinking, we all should be thinking, Goodness, he just fed 5,000 or more people with five loaves of bread and two fish and then walked on the water. What more signs do you need? But they're saying, well, Moses fed us with manna in the wilderness. And then Jesus had to point out, it wasn't Moses who fed you with manna in the wilderness. It was my father in heaven. Moses was the guy he called on to lead. But God was the one who parted the Red Sea. God was the one who fed the people in the wilderness. And now the Son of God is here to lead us further into what this is all about. And so Jesus finally comes to the point where he has one of those big I am statements in the gospel. And again, I'm going to pause for just a second about these I am statements because in English we're not so clear about what's going on as we are if we read Greek. Uh, Greek is like Latin and French and Spanish and other, other languages where you have verbs are conjugated by person and number. So when you have, the, in Greek, when you have am, a me, you can assume the I part because a me only goes with first person singular. If you say ego, I, in Greek, you're emphasizing the I by saying it. So Jesus is not saying, I'm the bread of life. He's saying, I am the bread of life. And all through the gospel, he makes these I am statements. Now, what does it mean to put our trust in I am the bread of life? What Jesus is calling us to, what he's reminding them is that there's more to life than just what you can see or what you can get. Don't work for the bread that doesn't endure. Work for the bread that endures to eternal life. Something deeper, something more important, something much more than simply what you see is what you get. This is an issue as much today as it was then forever. We talk about wanting a deeper, more spiritual life, but almost all of us tend to live as if what we see is what we get. You can just think back in popular culture just recently. I'm back in the 80s when I was going to seminary, right? there was a very popular bumper sticker, occasionally t-shirt, that says, the one who has the most toys when he dies wins. Right? Well, just money, whatever. There was a movie, Wall Street, right? And the, the protagonist says, greed is good. 
You know, go get what you want. That's all life's about is getting what you want. Well, using even Jesus' metaphor of the bread of life, people are hungry for more. And what we keep getting is less. We have, from any perspective of the political spectrum, we're being given a system of salvation which is always what you see is what you get. I'll give you salvation, vote for me, or give me your money or whatever, and I'll take care of it, but that doesn't lead to eternal life. And these false, false messiahs are all around us. Even our very faith has tended to shrink from the full message that Jesus gave. You ask people, a lot of people, what is Christianity all about? And their answer will be something like, well, if you follow Jesus uh, and you don't, you don't mess up and you're really good, then after you die, you'll get to go to heaven. And in heaven, everything's great. It's 72 degrees all the time. You have everything you want to eat, and it's just wonderful. But the gospel is telling us a story how God is creating heaven right here on earth. And God has called us to be part of this transformation of the world in love, which the other Gospels call the kingdom of God and which John calls eternal life. And it's happening here and now, not after we die. I mean, it continues after we die, but it's happening here and now. That's why in today's epistle, Paul is writing to the people and saying, lead a life worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Don't settle for something less. Don't live as if what you see is what you get. Live a life worthy of this gospel. And he goes, and he goes on to talk about one Lord, one faith, one baptism, all of this that calling us in, and that God has gifted us to continue this work. And he says, all of this, but not to get swayed by the false messiahs, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. And in every way, growing up into Christ, we then work together like one body, another metaphor, which is building itself up, building the world up in love. Presiding Bishop has said that the way of love is what the gospel's about. He keeps reminding us that the Jesus movement today is a movement about love. He says if it's about love, it's about God. If it's not about love, it's not about God. And we're being called, just as Jesus called those people on, in Capernaum 2,000 years ago, we are still being called to transform the world in love. A calling that's greater than just what we can see or feel or eat. And this is what the world is actually hungry for. Meaning, love, connection, purpose. And we, we have been privileged to be called into this fellowship with our Lord to be part of that transformation. So as Jesus said to them then, we say to each other now, strive for the bread which endures, the bread of life which is Jesus, through which he with us will be part of a completely transformed world, transformed in love. Amen.